this is County Historian Larry Tippin. We've been doing a series on our tiny towns, vanish villages, and then communities of Putnam County. Today, I want to talk about Morton, a community in northeastern Clinton Township. <clears throat> As we can see from this 1864 map of Putnam County, courtesy of the Library of Congress, I clipped out the northeastern portion of Clinton Township, where you see also see above it Russell and then to the east, Monroe, and then Franklin, north of that. See the Morton P.O., you see a church, and another church, and then a couple of miles, two and a half miles east of that, is what we call Hannah's Crossing. Some people call it mine, Nine Mile because it's nine miles north of Greencastle. So it's the intersection of U.S. 36, and current US 231, formerly the Ocean to Ocean Highway and the New Albany and Crawfordsville Turnpike at one time. This dash line that would have went just south of Morton was a proposed route of the Indiana and Illinois Central Railroad that was never built. It was spearheaded by Rockville attorney Addison Lock Roach after this company failed, he formed a new company which built a railroad north of here that went through Roachdale. You can read about that and hear about that in the presentation on Roachdale. There's not a lot of early history in Morton. We know the first land patent, land patent being the first deed from the United States government to the first settler or the pioneer, issued in 1826 and then 1828, section 10, which was southeast of Morton, and also in 1827 in section two of Clinton Township, which is northeast of Morton. And then James Butcher took out several land patents in section two, also in 1826, as noted in page 10 of the 1879 Illustrated Atlas and History of Putnam County, other parts of Clinton Township were settled as early as 1821. This is a very nice publication by Morton called Memories of Morton, written in 2009 by Malcolm Romine, edited by Paul Clubfelder. This is available at the Putnam County Museum. It's a very nice history of Morton and the people. If you'd like to get a copy of that, it's Putnam County Museum, very well written book. Markham noted there was not a lot of oral history, he has several pages. Most of this is interviews of the people of Morton of 2009, and very, uh, very nice and thoughtful recollections about Morton. It's very worth reading if you're interested in the Morton area or the people of Morton. Malcolm also notes in his publication, Memories of Morton, that the John Cloudfelder family came from North Carolina, August of 1830, settling just a little bit northwest of Morton along Raccoon Creek. Many descendants of this John Cloudfelder family are still around today in the Morton area and other places. <clears throat> this is an aerial view from the Putnam County's property tax website which shows more or less a current uh, look at Morton, where we see the store, the former garage, the substation, the park, RMC, very nice pole barn building recently built by Denny O'Hare and others to try to get some of the traffic going toward the Covered Riz Festival. And then down here highlighted was the Morton School, which later became the Morton Cell Barn. We'll talk about those as we go. About 20 homes currently. The post offices. The postmaster at Morton started in 1857, continuously without a break, to 1905. In 1905, the post office came up with the concept of rural free delivery where you would get your mail delivered to your mailbox. Prior to that time, you had to go to the post office to get your mail. 
most post offices or either in the general store or some other public place of business. And that was the case in Morton. And Malcolm, in his book, Memories of Morton, notes who some of the owners of the store were, who were also postmasters at the same time. Walter Swell, Milt Thomas, Burkett, Bettis, Columbus Clawfield, and others. And then we like to look at the newspapers, which has very interesting information and also gives us great insight to history of communities. Here's one from the Green Council banner, July 24th, 1884. Among other things, it notes that Milt Thomas will soon occupy his new store, and long, long after that, he was appointed the postmaster when the previous postmaster's term was up. You can pause any time if you'd like to read some of these articles, or you can go to the Hoosier Chronicles or Hoosier State Chronicles online and find these articles. It's very nice, very interesting. Pause any time if you'd like to read. If I get ahead of it, I'm going to the next slide. In 1880, a few years prior to that, notes that Milt Thomas is a notary public in Morton. He had been around a while, and he's a very prominent citizen of the Morton area. Another newspaper article from Evansville Daily Journal, October 23, 1885, talks about some of the new post offices in Indiana. And the second one listed is Little Walnut, Putnam County. Andrew Deardoff has been appointed the postmaster of this new post office called Little Walnut. And also a notice in the Putnam County banner, the Putnam Republican banner, about that time <clears throat> for the new post office called Little Walnut, which is Andrew Deardoff as postmaster. After he was appointed, there was one more postmaster, James Nicholson, until July 17, 1857, where it was discontinued. But then the post office was reinstated for a period of time in 1861. Let's go to the next slide and look at that. Pause if you'd like to read this. This is very valuable. Uh, publication called Postmasters 1832 to 1971, where the post office had a handwritten ledger where they noted who the postmasters were, the date of appointment, and the post offices. These first two little clips I've got out of this publication are actually the left hand side and the right hand side uh, of the same book. They wouldn't fit, so I clipped the right hand side, put it below it. But on the Little Walnut line, it notes Deardoff Nicholson. And then it says something, July 17th, 1857. It looks like that's Eli Morton, but we have not been able to find an Eli Morton anywhere in the area at that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. We looked at the 1860 census, 1870 census, cemetery records. We've not been able to find an Eli Morton. It looks like that may be two Morton. And then the very next line, this is still on the same page, the very next line below that says Morton Post Office with Thomas Sarnow on the very same day, July 17th, 1857. This is the first postmaster of Morton on the same day that the Little Wana Post Office was discontinued. Now, some people may think that means it was merely renamed. Well, that's not the case, because we see a couple of pages later, in 1861, this Robert Boston or Robert Burton, we can't tell really which, was appointed postmaster at Little Wanud, January 23, 1861, and then that post office was discontinued August 9th, 1861. For those nine months of 1861, then these two separate post offices were in operation. So they could not have been the same post office. Little Walnut was a separate post office at a separate location. This publication has been very valuable and helped us find a lot of the small communities, some we did not know about because we found the post offices and we've been able to determine where those communities were, we found a total of 49 post offices in Putnam County from the very beginning to the current ones. 
And we know where all of them are located, the exact location, except Little Walnut. Look at a map now. This is 1864 again, but this is the entire Clinton Township. So it's hard to read. So I pointed out Morton, Morton P.O. up here in the northeast part of the township. Going down several miles, you see Clinton Falls. We now call it Clinton Falls. In 1864, the only thing noted was a Dunkard Church. About a mile and a half upstream up Little Walnut was Alma. Alma had a post office from 1850 to 1860. In 1850 to 1858, the post office was called Grubbs Mill. And then from 1858 to 1860, it was, the post office was called Alma. And this was a case where the, the post office stayed in that location, but it was renamed. We could tell it was renamed. <clears throat> now, there are two other communities in Clinton Township where the post office might have been. One of them was over here on the Park Putnam County line in Putnam County. In the southwestern part of Clinton Township was a beach grove, church and cemetery, still there, had a trading post at one time. It's possible there could have been a post office there, which could have been called Little Walnut, but I think it's more likely the Little Walnut post office was down here at the southern part of Clinton Township, where the Little Walnut Baptist Church and cemetery was located. Cemetery is still there, church long gone. In 1864, there were also several, uh, a gristmill and a sawmill, and several homes, enough you could call it a community. So unless somebody can prove me wrong or can show me primary source documentation or otherwise, I believe the Little Walnut Post Office was down here by the Little Walnut Church in Southern Clinton Township. Related to the post office, this is a very interesting article in the banner. April 30th, 1863. On Saturday, the 18th of April of 1863, between the farms of Franklin Yates and H.C. Darnell, on the road leading from Greencastle to Portland Mills by way of Morton, a small revolver was lost. The finder will be liberally rewarded by leaving said pistol with the postmaster Morton or with the undersign. The pistol was loaded when lost. J.D. Allen, mail carrier. This is extremely significant from a historical point of view. It identifies who the mail carrier was. We'll go to the next slide. I'll explain that a little bit. Pause if you'd like to read this. <clears throat> the post office let out bids for contractors, an actual contract, to deliver mail from one post office to the next, not being like the current mail carriers where they bring mail to your box. That didn't start till 1905 with real free delivery. These contractors merely took mail from one post office to the next, and the contracts were specifically identified, usually for a four-year term, which is the case here, July 1st, 1858 to June 30th, 1862. So all the routes of the of the, the country, all the post office and all the routes of the country were identified, and the ones in the Indiana were published in the newspapers at the time, including the Daily Sentinel. You can go again to Hoosier Chronicles and read this if you like. But Route 12159 was advertised being from Belleville by Danville, New Westchester, Groveland, New Maysville, Carpentersville, Bainbridge, and Morton to Portland Mills, 42 miles and back six times a week to Danville, twice a week residue, whatever that meant, I'm sure they knew. And you see that they have specific times when it left Belleville, arrived at Danville, and then arrived and left Portland Mills, and then stopping at these other post offices along the way, where they carried the mail. Bevel, of course, being a hub, so to speak, because it was on the National Road. So they could get the mail, collect it from all these places, get it to Belleville, then it would go to Indianapolis, Terre Haute, or wherever for further sorting, or from Belleville to these locations. And you see that these routes are very specific about the times and the places. So the mail carriers then would be highly susceptible to highway robbery. Somebody could, uh, you know, they knew they were coming, regular route, they went through every day except Sunday, going through usually just a path through the forest, the very dense forest at the time, 
on horseback. So they, of course, had to have some sort of revolver with them, not just for the thieves, for potential thieves, but also the wild animals. Snakes as big as a fence post, they said. Uh, mountain lions, bears, and so forth. So they had to be armed, and that's why that revolver was being carried by the mail carrier. And then that article told us who the mail carrier was for this rob. Continuing on that same newspaper, the same advertisements for Route 12155 from Greencastle by Morton, Russell, Waveland, and on up into Fountain County, ending at Covington, 52 miles and back once a week, leaving Greencastle on Thursday and then coming back the next day and so forth, so on. So this is just one day a week. So this maybe would be a route where somebody would bid on this to supplement their income. So they could take a day out of their busy schedule and deliver the mail or carry the mail from East Post Office. You see that this one then is going north and south from Greencastle to Covington and back. So that made Morton a major hub of the mail. There's east-west route and a north-south route. Both went through Morton. Very significant, Morton was a very large post office because of that. Going back to 1864, now just do a little bit of a close up just to see who some of the people were living in this area. In 1864, we see that Morton is the intersection of sections 2, 3, 10, and 11 of Clinton Township. Again, it's, no, it's Morton PO. It's not Morton Town. Morton was never incorporated town. Morton PO. In 1864, they note the store and other places, Methodist Church and Cemetery, and we're going to look at some uh, the school and some other things here, and more maps. Love our maps. So a lot of maps here. This is 1879. We see Morton P.O. Still called Morton P.O. And then over here, a mile west of it, is the Union Chapel Methodist Church. And then here it says the school number two is south of that. 1864, it said it was west. And then school number one, which is a mile east of Morton. And then you see some of the people here, Butcher, Raglan, Ramsey, Thomas, Darnell, and so forth. In 1879, the communities that were big enough, like Greencastle, Cloverdale, and so forth, there was a detail of those, which is what we have here in 1879. The 1879 Atlas, the Putnam County Museum, reprinted that it's a very high quality reproduction of. Uh, the 1879 Atlas is being reprinted five times. Prior to that, you see this edition is available for sale at the Putnam County Museum. In this, we see, I checked the downtown area and blew it up to the right here. We see the blacksmith shop, the store and PO, very clearly saying now that the store had the post office, which we really kind of already knew. West of the store, there was an inn of sorts which is basically what we would now call bed and breakfast, just a room or two where somebody could spend the night, get a meal. Thomas Clap Saddle. The parsonage for the Methodist Church, more than likely the Union Chapel Methodist Church. And then this is noted as being at the section corner of sections 2, 3, and 11, Township 15 North, Range 5 West. Whenever they could, they built roads on the line between two sections, partly because that would have been cleared by the original surveyors were all the way back in the 1820s. And it was much more convenient and easier to build the roads on those section lines, like what's well, now Highway 36 and this road. And then the road that goes north to Russville and goes off, and then it goes north. And then this one goes southeast toward the Somerset Church, Brick Chapel. And then there's a toll gate at this road. We'll talk about the toll gate a little bit. Going back to some of these fun and interesting newspaper articles, this is one from 1865, all the way back to 1865, where this O.P. Crawford has invented a swimming platform that you could attach to any reaper machine. The earliest reapers really were nothing more than a sickle bar, which was um, of course, metal wheels, horse-driven. I've got one in my yard, if you'd like to see what it looks like. 
and gear driven by the wheels with a pitman board that moved the sickle. And all it did was just cut the, the stalk, usually the wheat or oats around here. And it just fell on the ground. Somebody would have to come by and, and rake it up and shock it. And then when McCormick came out with his reaper in 1831, it laid it on a platform. But they started to stop periodically and gather it and shock it. So this proper's swinging platform, apparently, from what they say, would, it would gather, it would fall on this platform, gather it, and then you could stop it, it would swing out and deposit it. So all you had to do was come up and gather it and shock it. And it shows that Benjamin Franklin Yates of Morton apparently is the dealer for this implement. And then it lists some of the farmers who are endorsing this. You see Carver, McMain, Wright, Graham, Turpin, Darnell, Joel Butcher, both prominent farmers of the Morton area that we see in several other instances. James Boyd, Thomas McBride, a little bit of a who's who of the farmers of the Morton community continuing on. We have another who's who type interesting thing. In the, the Green Castle banner, January 22nd, 1863, it lists the subscribers who are getting the banner at the Morton Post Office. Of course, like the mail, your newspaper wasn't delivered to your door. It was taken to the post office. You had to go and get it. So they're hoping that maybe one of the neighbors who is not subscribing is reading somebody's paper before they can come and get it. And then maybe they'll pay the money to get their own. So you see some of the names. This is, again, a very significant and lengthy who's who of the people getting their mail at Morton, or at least subscribing to the people getting the, the paper at the Morton Post Office. Darnell, Leeton, George Frank, Crawford, Ben Wysong, John Williams, James Butcher, James H.C. Nelson, George Cooper, Elza Butcher, it's not Eliza, it's Elza, Martin Frank, Jesse Collins, James Farrell, Williams Farrell, Ed Scott, Nelson Wood, William Miller, David Rambo, Gilliams, Talley, Darnell, Ed Rosencrantz, William McKee, Turpin Darnell, and Joel Butcher, who we just read about, Bishop, Tibbet, Milt Thomas, Fritz, and John Risk. Very significant identification of the people that lived in that area in 1863. It's in an 1882 article. From Saturday night, a farm, house, and eight outbuildings were burnt to the ground, apparently by an arsonist. Belonged to Darton, uh, Dr. Newton, and this property being three miles southwest of Morton. So this identifies one of the doctors of the area at the time, Dr. Nugent. Stop if you'd like to read it. Depending on another article in 1883 saying that H.C. Darnell sold his farm west of Morton to Elza and Milt Thomas, <clears throat> and also several other things. And then Henry Rambo had to chop his sheep loose from the ground after the sleet storm. That's kind of amusing and interesting. Pause, we'd like to read it, moving on. Another article in 1882 talked about the gravel road. Because the Morton was a significant crossroad, first with the early males and later with the roads, the gravel roads are very important to Morton. Saying here, the work on the Portland Mills and Green Castle free gravel road is progressing. And then the Morton Gravel Road is being regraveled. The directors of the latter and the teamsters of the former apparently had some dispute of some sort, which was settled by the county, county commissioners who agreed to pay the Morton Company's toll. The next article, the unexpired time of Dr. Dilley for the pauper practice of Clinton Chancellor was given by the county commissioners to Dr. Young of Morton. Read a lot about Dr. Dilley in the uh, Clinton Falls presentation. He's quite an interesting character, but it shows here that we're taking care of our people even way back then by giving them some basic medical service provided by the township and identifies two of the doctors involved with that. 
And then you like to read the rest of this article. It talks about political speeches by Silo Say and Dr. Sparrow and so forth. Pause if you'd like to read it. Moving on. We see an article in 1881 about the annual tax paid by corporations of Putnam County. This is almost a whole page. You can see that I clipped out just the relevant part of the Morton Gravel Road Company, which is paying $10.70 for the portion in Clinton Township and $1.21 for the portion in Monroe Township. And then this article also in 1881, meeting at the County Board of Equalization, where they're basically trying to get a fair and equal and proportionate assessment of businesses and corporations for tax purposes. They mentioned the Bainbridge and Morton Gravel Road, several other gravel roads in the county, the Greencastle Street Railroad, $1,500, and the Iron and Nail Works, $35,000, a very large, significant amount. We talk about the Iron and Nail Company of Green Council in different presentations, one of the earliest and prominent businesses of the county. Moving on. This is a very significant article. The 1879 Alice Putnam County did not cite its sources. It was our first compiled history, didn't cite its sources, but we're finding out where some of those, uh, some of the information came from. We found out that there was a group in January of 1869 met and decided that the old timers should document, write down the reminiscence and recollections of the early days. These people were now in their 70s and 80s, trying to remember what happened 40 years or 50 years prior to that time. This company organized, and then monthly they had presentations, uh, a speech type presentation giving to the Pioneer Club. This is the one in February of 1869, later made it to the newspaper in March, March 11th, by Colonel Alexander George Farrow, a very prominent citizen of the area. At his farm was northwest of Hannes Crossing, which you've discussed, about two miles west, or two miles, excuse me, east of Morton. <clears throat> Colonel Farrow, veteran of the War of 1812, a very prominent citizen. <clears throat> These articles continue very valuable historical information. Some of them are just reminiscing about interesting and humorous events, a chivalry or you know, a bear or something. Some of them are. And Colonel Farrow actually had a second one later where he had some interesting observations. Um, there was about 15 of those. I found almost all of them. haven't found them all yet, but I hope I will. And a lot of valuable historical information came from these articles. And some of it, again, made it to the 1879 Atlas, our first history. Following along with what Colonel Farrow said in this article, pause, we'd like to read it. You can see that I chopped it up for presentation purposes it's on several slides. Colonel Farrow saying he first came to Putnam County December of 1829. The winter was quite open. As a farmer, he would talk about the weather, saying the weather was warm and cloudy with very little rain or snow. At that, rep, at that time, the roads were not stiff, miry clay as they were in 1869, but were a thin slush. If you'd like to read the whole thing, pause, but I'm continuing, saying that Colonel Farrow bought a quarter section of land 10 miles north of Greencastle, and again, we typically call that nine mile, about 20 acres of which was cleared, and then quite a bit of timber, which they had to clear so they could farm it. He hired the man from whom he purchased this farm to raise a crop the coming season, which was done. And that would have been William Moss, who had the first land patent for the quarter section northwest of Hannah's Crossing. Continuing, in October of 1830, Colonel Farrow became a citizen of the county. I don't know why he became a citizen in October of 1830. Maybe he went back, got his family, and that's when he formally, I don't know, started to live there. I don't know. But anyway, he became a citizen formally in October of 1830. Very significant information. 
I was waited on by two of my new neighbors, Skady Chandler, if I'm pronouncing that right, and Newton Allen, living about four miles off. We've got a map that shows where that was in just a little bit. Ask him if you need anything. Of course, you couldn't bring your provisions with you. And he's coming in December of 1829. He hasn't had time to lay in any provisions. So he buys pork from Chandler for $2.50 per hundredweight. And then Alan, who had hay, um, sold him a shock of hay or stock of hay for $8. And these men noted that newcomers, as they were called, furnished the only marker for the older settlers. Older settlers had been there 10 years by 1830. And they had to sell or the biggest market for their uh, excess crops above and beyond what they could raise themselves was the newcomers. Again, the newcomers really couldn't bring everything with them, and they really didn't have time to, to lay in their own provisions. So they brought their provisions from the settlers who had previously been there. And Allen says he's regretting that the, the country is so nearly filled up. And then the market for surplus is, is gone now, drying up, so to speak. Continuing, this is a little bit about the evils of whiskey. Colonel Farrow was very much against drinking. He talks about when they have uh, log rollings and so forth. He didn't partake, and several of his neighbors, as he noted down here, Nelson Foster and Leighton, combined with him. They were joined forces and decided to not allow liquor and drinking and so forth. Pause if you'd like to read it. Going on, this is very significant. It talks about that there were no church buildings in the neighborhood in 1830 when he moved. And my house was used as a public place of worship for a number of years. Our present Methodist Society at Faro Chapel was organized in it by William Smith of Greencastle. I was hoping that this would say a year, but I blew it up. You can see off to the right, it says in it. So it doesn't say what year that that Pharaoh's chapel was organized and where the building was built. We're gonna look at that in a map in just a second. This is very significant historical information. If you'd like to pause and read his conclusions. Go on. All right, this 1864 map again. Again, I like my maps. You can see two miles east of Morton on West Nile 36. Methodist Chapel. That was where Pharaoh's Chapel was, as he was talking about, a Methodist church. Also, a mile west of Morton was the Union Chapel Methodist Church. Again, 1864, the school is noted as being west of that. And then you see Morton, P.O. And then another school. This is school number one, and the one over here by Union Chapel is school two. We'll talk about those schools in just a few minutes. And then just summarizing what Colonel Farrow said, the Farrow Chapel, two miles east of Morton, organized by that William Smith, probably in the early 1830s. Colonel Farrow didn't give the dates, but that's okay. He gave us a lot of valuable historical information. We can get it within a time frame. We don't need the exact date. And the building was probably constructed, I must say, maybe the mid 1830s, maybe the late 1830s. Again, that's that's close enough very significant. And then a mile west of Morton, of course, Union Chapel Church, first established 1836. They built their log building in 1838. And then the current brick building, which is now over 120 years old, was constructed 1896. We can see that it's a newspaper article at the time. Again, I enjoy reading the newspaper articles from the Hoosier Chronicles. This is one from June of 1896, saying the new Methodist Episcopal Church will be built near the site of the existing Union Chapel Log Church building near Morton. And then it goes on to talk about that grand building. You'd like to pause and read it. That's June. September of 1896, the new church at Union Chapel is nearing completion and the trustees are desiring to sell the old log structure, which offered the highest bidder the following Monday. Very neat. 
Not long after that, in November of 1896, the cemetery at Union Chapel has been incorporated in a proper cemetery company. Prior to that time, the parishioners were being buried in the church graveyard, and then now it's got a formal cemetery company organized as a corporation. The following year, September of 1897, under the real estate transfers, we see at the bottom, Patsy McCray, and then Chris and Frank have sold land in Clinton Township to the Union Chapel Methodist Episcopal Church. I believe that's to expand the cemetery to the south, which started as a church graveyard near the church, of course, and then it was expanded to the south. <clears throat> Article in 1877, an interesting meeting was just closed at Pharaoh's Chapel near Morton with eight or ten accessions to the church, 1877, February 22nd. And then in March of 1884, this article, March the 6th, say all persons who wish to see the union of the two churches of Morton should be at Union Chapel next Saturday at two o'clock and help to unite them. So what they're saying is the Pharaoh's Chapel Church is going to discontinue in 1884, we don't know exactly when it was built, sometime in the 1830s, but we know exactly to the day when it was discontinued, and it was joined with the Union Chapel Church, and then services for those two churches are now going to be at Union Chapel, and Pharaoh Chapel is no longer. It goes on to say, our school closed Friday with a grand exhibition in Union Chapel at night. Miss Block and Miss Maggie Grady have given the best satisfaction Miss Block teaching at school number two, which was near Union Chapel called the Beckenridge, I believe. I apologize if I'm not right. And then school number one is the one a mile east of Morton we saw on the map. We'll talk about that more. We expect to have a gravel road south from Morton to be built this year, 1884. We don't expect to be bothered with thieves anymore in this vicinity. Malcolm talks about this a little bit in his Memories of Morton book, where we had some people that were going into homes when people were not home and ransacking the homes. And one of those was a woman, but they caught these people. And apparently this is what they're talking about. Going back a little bit, 1883, a Sunday school has been organized at Union Chapel and is well attended. Ditching is being done. You know, the farmland up around Morton is predominantly flat, a little bit of rolling along Owl Creek, but mostly flat. So drainage is a real problem then as now. So I had to do some ditching for drainage purposes for the farms. You see lightning rod peddlers are trying to scam people. And then last Friday, two horses belonging to Milt Thomas running loose in a pasture came badly frightened. They were cut as they ran through a fence. H.T. Thomas was a roadmaster of District 1. Elmer Grimes says ground, uh, corn ground is scarce. And then Robert Whitehead, or Whitted, whichever way you pronounce it, left the store muddy. He sold the store to George Paxson. He was the postmaster from 18, from January to May of 1885, at which time Milt Thomas took over as postmaster. Expand this a little bit, 1864 map again. You see the Morton PO, and then on the road that goes southeast of Morton toward Somerset Church, the former Somerset Church or Brick Chapel, there is Skady Chandler, you also see a Methodist church and a school. A couple of miles west, a couple of miles west, we see Darnell has, on the land of Darnell, is a Baptist church and a cemetery. We've already talked about the Beach Grove Church, which was along the county line, southwest of Morton, and then south of Morton, the, the Little Walnut Church. So some of the churches in Clinton Township. Article in 1881, Miss Jenny Kelly teaching the school at Morton, bless her heart. 
this is a really, really nice photo from a publication called School in Your Hand, published by the Retired Teachers of Putnam County, I believe 1976, where they, they have photos and history of the townships and their schools. There's also a very nice publication about schools in Clinton Township. You can read both of those at the library if you'd like. This is the White Knob School, 1888, which is number, school number one, which is a mile east of Morton, where Maggie Grady is a teacher. And if this is good enough quality to read, you can see some of these people. If you're from this area, this may be some of your ancestors. And some of the old timers still living maybe had conversations with these people when these people were older. It's very, very neat to see what they look like when they were young. This is a very nice photo. This school was closed in 1919. Going on, pause to read this if you like, or get this book and read it. The library, 1921, the Morton School was constructed. There, there are two major schools in Clinton Township, this one and Clinton Center, which was uh, about five miles to the south, just north of Clinton Falls. This school closed 1947. The township ran the schools at that time. The township trustee said he could not justify having two big schools so close to each other. So he closed Morton. There was dwindling uh, population or the students enrollment was down. So he closed the Morton School sent those students to Clinton Center, which itself closed, I believe, in 1967. And those students went to Bainbridge, now it's part of the North Putnam system. In 1950, then, the former Morton School was purchased by an auctioneer from Rockville, became a sale barn. Morton sale barn, you can see that they added to it where they had the ring and then the pins where you could go and get a belly goat or maybe feeder pigs or whatever. And usually the sales were on a Monday. I've been there a number of times myself. And if you were good, sat quietly, didn't bother your parents, at lunchtime, you could go to the old cafeteria school and have a delicious beef Manhattan where the roast beef was so thick you had to cut it with a steak knife. I can still remember that. Going on. 1871, there's an article on the banner. Work has commenced on the gravel road. The attention the company work vigorously as weather allows. Morton has a croquet fever very badly. We have some very good croquet players, among whom we may mention Dan Connor, Meredith Mason, Tom Nelson, Milt Thomas. We've seen that name a number of times today. Reverend Mason and Zed Goodwin. Zed is a champion player. Some of the boys prefer marbles. John Twig thinks he is the best, but Jim Goodwin says he will play a match game with him if he will agree to beat him cheating. But the most significant thing in this article that I wanted to show you is the very end. Wherever Thomas Webster preached at Union Chapel Sunday morning at Pharaoh's Chapel that afternoon. So you're saying in 1871, before Pharaoh's Chapel closed, this preacher was at both of those Methodist churches, West and East of Morton, respectively. Moving on. Very interesting article, 1871. The Morton Gravel Road is finished to the great satisfaction of all concern. Well, maybe not all concern, because we see in 1884, Darnell Bainbridge and Lewis of Greencastle had a row in front of the barber shop of Fussler and Meltzer's. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. During which Darnell struck Lewis, and then Lewis pulled a revolver, but was prevented from using it by Officer Souter and one of the barbers. The difficulty grew out of the building of the Morton so called Free Gravel Road, which passes land belonging to Lewis. Darnell being the contractor for the road. Then the newspapers are pining that these roads will be the death of somebody yet. Continuing. 
1986, we see in our article, the Gravel Road Company met Saturday for the purpose of selling the Toll House. Elsa Thompson, being the highest bidder, was the lucky man. So he purchased the Toll House, and he gets to collect the toll. We saw Elsa Thomas mention a number of times. <clears throat> also, there's a delegate from the Morton Horse Company called to Cropsville last week, an important business about the horse company. The horse company was the horse thief company or the horse detective company. They were almost vigilante level group that had official standing, almost like the Pinkertons being private citizens. And horse thieving, of course, was a very significant uh, crime. You can read more about that in Malcolm's Memory of Morton, but more detailed in the Putnam County Museum quarterly newsletter that we call The Arch. In the April 2019 edition, Paul Rimmer wrote about the National Horse Thief Detective Association and including, in addition to what he talked about, a listing of the directory and Putnam County, where we see Brick Chapel, Morton, Rochdale, Russville, Big Walnut, which is at Rillsville, Bainbridge, and Castle with a K, which was apparently located at Fillmore. And if you want to read more about this, you can get the Putnam County Arch, Putnam County Museum newsletter. In my opinion, this is very worthwhile uh, to be a member of the museum, to get the newsletter, and the many other benefits did you get being a member of the Putnam County Museum? But if you want to be a member of the museum, you can get the arch. We can get you some back copies if you'd like to read about this horse detective company. That's everything I have on Morton. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope you come back and we can talk about more of the small communities of Putnam County.